twice or thrice had I loved thee, before I knew thy face or name. So in a voice, so in a shapeless flame, angels affect us oft and worshipped be. Welcome to Metaphysical Mondays on the Troubadour Podcast. Today we are going to cover another John Donne poem. This one is called Air and Angels. Now this is another of the tougher John Donne um, poems, but I think it's worth it for a couple of reasons. One, if you are at all interested in history, one aspect of history that is overlooked in those that read it or you know, watch the History Channel, is getting in the mindset, in the skin, in the psyche of a person living in this era. And so if you try to understand what it was like to live in, say, a pre-Newtonian world, a world before science really came into its own and began to mechanistically examine and and to prove a fundamental truth that what happens in the heavens, what we would call space and outer space, are governed by the same laws that happened on earth, that there is no fundamental difference between the heavens and earth. This is one of the grand discoveries of the Newtonian world is that, and and Galileo and and all these um, scientists is that, you know, even Benjamin Franklin, like one of the things he was trying to prove was that the lightning up in the sky is the same lightning that we get with when we rub two pieces of paper together and we get static electricity. He was trying to prove that there's a similarity there because they didn't believe that. They believed it was something fundamentally different. It was ethereal. It was ephemeral. It was heavenly. It was something magical. And this is a world, the world of John Donne, that is in pre-Newtonian world. He's living in the very early, he's um, late 1500s, early 1600s. Think of him as a 16th century poet. He wrote this poem, Air and Angels, early 1600s. I believe it was published in 1633, but it was written much earlier than that. I believe he died around that that time, uh, 1633. So, This is a poem that will give you a little bit of an interesting view of an analogy that this metaphysical poet would make about love, masculine love versus feminine love. Now, on a personal view, now here's a question that is challenging to address honestly. Obviously, we think we know the answer right away, and and I'm sure you do, but I would ask this question I'm about to ask, I would ask you first to just try to not think of it as I know the answer. It's a simple answer, obviously. But think about it. Just really think about it. If you're, if this is going to be a, um, something that men and women are going to answer differently, maybe. And it's going to be a, a one that has been asked for thousands of years. It's one that's an open question until more recently. And the question is, of the sexes, male, female, which sex loves the other sex more intensely, more strongly? Don't think about time. So you may think, well, men cheat and they don't last long enough. Think about the intensity when they do love. So when a woman loves a man, is that as, as intense as when a man loves a woman? Is it as strong? Think about that. It seems obvious, but of course, there are differences between the sexes, so maybe maybe there is something different. Now, in defense of what's going on in this era, or uh, in uh, uh, attacking of it, and in defense of the people who attack this era, f- like feminists, for instance, I, I'm going to defend them for a second. They are correct when they say that at this time, you're not getting a diversity of, of uh, voices here. So this is John Donne, a male most of the you know poets of this time are men, um, or all of them pretty much. I mean, the, the painters are men, so the depictions that they get are male. The, the literary writers of plays and, and the uh, stories are male. I mean, there's a, you know, Jane Eyre isn't for another 200 years. You know, we don't get that female. Emily Dickinson isn't for another couple. Of, we're not getting any of that for a long time, 
right? We, we're, we're not getting Mary Shelley, Mary Walsencroft, her, her, her mother. So, I mean, this, this first wave of feminism hasn't even occurred. So this is, which is one reason why you should read this, because it gives you a sense of what the realities were. And if you can try and take a non-judgmental path and just try to think about it seriously, you know, to entertain the thought without accepting the thought, it's, it can be an exercise in understanding who came before us and how we got here and why they thought the way that they did. So that's all to set up air and angels. Now, there's a couple things you're going to need to know and, and why I've been setting it up in this way. One, we need to have a little bit of a talk about angels. So if you think of angels, I ha- if you're on Facebook or YouTube, you can see a, um, a picture here. And I'll show a, a couple more pictures in a second, but uh, or paintings, I, sh- I should say. And I'm not going to go into an analysis of the painting. It's not that important for my purposes. What I'm trying to show you is the reality that paintings at, in era, the era of John Donne in the 1600s dominantly portrayed angels, you know, these creatures with wings that come from heaven as male. Now, that's very important. Most angels were men. That's, that's what we see, and that's what we're looking at here is just a couple of paintings of male, although this one and this first one that I have um, is, you know, and it's uh, Gabriel, but he, he kind of looks, you know, uh, unisexual. You can't, uh, you can't tell he's a, as much, but it, it, it's clear with, on what's going on in the scene. Um, you know, that's Joseph over there. Poor old Joseph. You know, he's about, he's, he's like, I want to, you know, sleep with my wife and, and have a baby with her. And God's like, nope, sorry. I'm going to send this angel Gabriel to tell you that I'm going to impregnate your woman. What? Okay, so then we have some other angels here. There's a muscular angel. You know, another angel, and this is a, a male angel. So the point is that what we get in angels is that they are men. That's important to, to dis, distinguish in this sense um, because that's going to be the analogy that he draws, that... that um, John Donne draws is with masculine angels and masculine love. And and so it's important to think about that because he's going to have an analogy playing throughout of what is love and, you know, how can you manifest love? How can you, you know, this think about the emotion, the feeling is I love you. Like that feeling you have when you love somebody and it, and it hurts your heart or your, you know, your throat gets constricted and all these physical things happen, but it's just an emotion. It's a, And if we think about personifying it, spiritualizing it, it's just this thing that floats in the air. So how do we manifest that in a physical sense? So he's going to give a couple of analogies on how that can occur. Now, another thing you're going to need to understand is the pre-Newtonian idea that was very you know prevalently believed of the four major elements that made up the world. Now, this isn't something that, you know, is 100%. Um, it, it's evolved since the time of ancient Greeks when this was first uh, thought up of, thought up. But there is something important that when you're talking about, let's say, an angel in the Christian theology of this time, an angel, which is, remember, masculine generally, needs to be manifested to humans through a medium. This is the the thinking that was going on as well. They, they have to come to us somehow. How do they get here? Right. And so the question that the way that they thought of it, and you know, you think of medium as like earth, water, fire, air, and the, the most pure one, which would be the one that an angel would use would be air. So an angel would manifest itself in air. The most, you know, angelic of creatures would be airy. Right. And then that's, that's, they would come into it. And then there's a sense of course, that angels are above, air even so there there's there's something above thought and love angels are above that if we look at a hierarchy which they they loved hierarchies so if you think you know there's there's humans there's the the thought that we can have the love we can feel that's a concept that's a little bit higher air maybe as a medium but then above that is angel the angel is even more um pure than the air that brings it to life and so there's there's kind of that we're going to see an interplay between all that. 
Okay, so I'm going to read this very challenging poem to you. It, it, <laughs> to say that it won't make sense is an understatement. I'm going to do my best to uh, help the meaning along a little bit. But it's a, it's a challenge. It's it's a challenge. I, you know, just like I've said on some of the other John Donne poems, I'm not claiming to be an expert. One thing I've learned about John Donne and one of the differences between him and Wordsworth is that with Wordsworth, you know, it's he's ushering in a modern era. John Donne is truly in a, a you know more ancient era, and you know not not technically ancient, but you know pre-modern and so there is some just the way that he talks is going to be vastly different i mean it's only um you know only but it's only 150 years or so when this was written versus when lyrical ballads which i'm reading on sundays was written so um that doesn't seem like a lot but it is i mean 1600 well it's actually almost 200 years from then so it's a pretty big difference 1600 to 1800 pretty much so yeah it's a, it's a good amount of time and then of course we're separated from wordsworth from 1800 to 2000 so we're, we're talking another 200 plus years so the farther back you go the more difficult the language is going to be i mean if you go to the 1300s you're going to have some very difficult challenges reading chaucer for instance not just because the meaning is difficult but because the language has evolved so much so we're getting a little bit of that here um, but there's, you know, most of the term, the words, the spelling, for instance, has been updated for the version we're reading. Um, you know, he would have spelled air, A I R E, I believe, um, or, or even A E R E. So there, you know, there's, there's some things like that, that has for this version that we're reading has been updated, but for the most part, the words aren't crazy. You know, when it says angels affect us oft. And worshipped be, you know, oft just means often. Wert is, you know, were to where thou, to where you were, to where the, to where thou wert is to where you were. Things like that. I mean, what you think it might be is probably what it is in, in uh, some terms like that. Okay, so let's give this beast a try. <laughs> let's uh, let's go through it, and then we'll go. There's only two stanzas. So we'll just kind of go in groupings of four lines to kind of analyze it or some grouping like that. Okay. Air and Angels by John Dunn. Twice or thrice had I loved thee before I knew thy face or name. So in a voice, so in a shapeless flame, Angels affect us oft, and worshipped be. Still when, to where thou wert, I came, Some lovely glorious nothing I did see. But since my soul, whose child love is, Takes limbs of flesh, and else could nothing do, More subtle than the parent is, love must not be, But take a body too. And therefore, therefore, what thou wert, and who, I bid love ask. And now that it assume thy body, I allow, and fix itself in thy lip, eye, and brow. Whilst thus to ballast love I thought, and so more steadily to have gone, with wares which would sink admiration, I saw I had love's pinnace overwrought, overfraught. Every thy hair for love to work upon is much too much. Some fitter must be sought. For, nor in nothing, nor in things extreme and scattering bright, can love in here. Then, as an angel, face and wings, of air, not pure is it, yet pure, doth wear, so thy love may be my love's fear. Just such disparity as is twixt air and angel's purity, twixt women's love and men's will ever be. 
Woo. All right. <laughs> what a mouthful, man. Okay. So, you know, I hope you're going to find this worthwhile. I think it's a good exercise in expanding your ability with language to do the, to go through these kinds of poems, to uh, not just blow them off because they're difficult, because this is difficult for me, at least it's really difficult to understand what's going on here in these terms. And, you know, because of the separation with just to give you another example of the challenges between a modern and a pre-modern is that with Wordsworth a lot, you know, in Coleridge and a lot of the romantics, there are things that he alludes to, to some degree. There are things that he talks about that I'm not a hundred percent familiar, but we're living in a kind of a, the same world, especially someone like Wordsworth. So I can pick up a Wordsworth poem and just read it and write out my thoughts on what, you know, like rearrange the words and put it into normal syntax. And, and it makes a little bit of sense. I, with this, I got, I have to do a little bit of research. So just so you're aware, I'm doing a little bit of research, not like days of research. I'm just looking some things up. I'm kind of doing some research like about the angels. Like I didn't, you know, I, I'd heard that before, but I wasn't clear on it for this particular poem. So, so my point is that when you go back further in time, you're going to probably need that more. You're going to need those, those bits of research to help you out. And so that's okay. Though I would still recommend reading the poem once or twice and trying to get something out of it and then going to the research. But, you know, do what you can. So we get the analogy starting pretty early, but we get this idea he begins, the, the speaker starts saying, you know, to, so it's him saying, I loved thee. So he's talking to somebody and he's saying twice or thrice had I loved thee. So he's saying either, you know, this is the thing about these, po po uh, these poems from Dunn and the metaphysical poets. I think there is kind of a multitude of meaning that you can get so many meanings out of it. So many more meanings even than a normal poem. So it's, you know, most poems, it's, people say you can get a lot of meanings out of that. This poem, it's a lot of meanings you get out of these things. So for instance, I think you could take that as twice or thrice had I loved thee before I knew thy face or name. So before I even knew who you were, I loved you. I loved you two or three times more than anything in the world or something like that. Or you could even have a sexual component to it as I loved thee, like I had sex with you before I even know your name, right? Or before I really knew you, right? Before thy face or name. Now, my initial thought is that it's the, the, the former, the idea that, you know, we're trying to move into a spiritual world. Like that's something we do know about this poem after reading it a couple of times. So we're, he's, he's going from, uh, this, <laughs> so it could be either or actually, you know, so he's going from maybe the sexual world into the spiritual world, or he's trying to start by penetrating. Uh, that's not a good analogy or a good metaphor. He started by, by, uh, um, piercing the veil, uh, you know, and going through this idea of who she is at her essence, right? Like you think about that, what is a person's consciousness, their spirit, their soul, their soul immortal, right? And so that their soul, your soul. So before I'm Kirk, before I'm a Barbera, right? My family name, before I even have a body, my face, I'm a spirit. So before I knew thy face or name. I loved it. Sorry. You know, I loved your spirit. That's another way. I think that's probably the way he's taking it, but you could also take it in a, a, the physical way. Cause he is bringing up this physicality thing. Now he's, he's going to talk about this voice in a shapeless flame. So in a voice, so in a shapeless flame, angels affect us oft and worshiped be. So, you know, now he's invoking the angels. So an angels, you know, they, they come on high with their strong, booming Gabriel voice and his, oh, like a, you know, a horn. Remember, this is a masculine thing. So he's making the argument um, throughout this poem, and there's actually going to be two analogies I, I forgot to mention earlier. So he's going to switch analogies in a bit. But for now, he's talking about the angel, which, and worshipped be, they need to be worshipped. And his love, his, that is twice before, his love for her essence, for her soul, not just her body, right? So we're talking about uh, soul love. And it, it's, he's, you know, analogizing it to angels who affect us often and they should be worshiped. 
So this feeling that I have is like an angel in itself. Like I'm going to personify it in a, I'm going to, and, uh, angelify it. I don't know how to put that into a word, you know, to, to turn this into an angel, this l- feeling of love. Still when to where thou wert, I came some lovely, glorious nothing I did see. Okay, so here we have a paradox, by the way, but I think it makes sense within what he's talking about. So some lovely, glorious nothing I did see. If you break that up or break strip away everything from it except what he's saying is some nothing I I did see. So the you know the fray, the main clause is I did see some lovely what what did I see some lovely glorious nothing. Wait, what? How do you see a nothing? Right. So that's a that's a um a, a, a paradox. But when we're talking about the soul, you can't see the soul. I can't really see the air I breathe unless it's cold, right? But right now, you can just see there's, there's air everywhere. I'm breathing it in, but I can't see it. So still some lovely, glorious nothing I did see. And so the seeing is some kind of special sight he has, and it's probably given to him by his love for her. But since my soul, whose child love is, okay, so you got to follow that one. So the, the, um, the soul, his soul, is the child of love. All right. So does that make sense at all? So he, he has a soul just like Kirk has a soul, but the soul is really a, a child of love. Now it could be a child of the love of his parents, right? So that's one way of thinking about it. Or it could also be affected by this woman that he's now in love with. So deeply in love with. Now, um, he's maintained the, um, the analogy between angel and masculine love here takes limbs of flesh and else could nothing do. So we have this, we have this, but since my soul whose child love is takes limbs of flesh. So we're moving into the physical world here. This child of love, his love, which comes from his love for this woman must take a bodily form, limbs of flesh. It can be no less subtle than the parent. His love, Take, and else could nothing do more subtle than the parent is. Love must not be, but take a body too. So love must not be. It cannot be. You can't have love without the body. So his soul, which is the child, is a very confusing little set phrase here, or section here, as a lot of it is. The soul is the child of love, and it must take on limbs of flesh. It must be... Uh, Become flesh, it must have physicalization is the term that I would use in terms of, you know, my view of what he's trying to argue for this whole thing is that love has to be physicalized. But in his mind or in his poem, it doesn't mean physicalized as in the behavior, the action of sex, for instance, which is what I would say is necessary for this kind of love is that, you know, this kind of love needs to be um, in, needs to come to life, needs to be brought into the world through physical love, which is sex. He's saying like an actual body, like, like a Frankenstein monster, but more angelic, right? Like, so an angel, so an actual, and it needs to have limbs of flesh. So remember we talked about the medium, right? So an angel has to manifest itself to humans in a medium. The medium is air in, in, in this case. Well, how does love manifest itself? How does it kind of, burst into existence well through limbs of flesh um and uh, nothing else can do it has to have a body so how does it do it it has to happen through his masculine love like it's he's so you know and uh, just like how an angel would do it it comes through his masculine love so love alone the spiritual love is insufficient it too requires a body the medium thus what you are and who you are i ask to love to tell me i bid you ask so Check out this next section. And therefore, what thou wert and who I bid love ask. And now that it assumed thy body, I allow and fix itself in thy lip, eye, and brow. So, you know, he's going to ask, he's asking love something, right? Thus, what you are and who you are, I want love to know. So who is he talking to? He's either talking to the woman or their love. Probably this new embodied love, 
right? And I bid love to tell me, I bid capital L love to tell me what this thing is. Now it assumes your body. So the medium that it's coming through, so here's, I think, where he's, he, he um, actually concretizes the medium that happens and he gives voice to it. The medium for their love, the medium for their love is the woman's body. Catch that? The woman's body. I allow and fix itself, you know, that I bid love ask, and now that it assume your body, I allow. Right? He's allowing this, right? Because he's the man. And fix itself in thy lip, eye, and brow. He's just like naming off things. This is a common thing in poetry of this period. He's just naming off body parts. The lip, eyebrow. Now, there, there's maybe something special to that. You know, the mouth, the sight, and I guess above, above the sight, the brow. I don't know <laughs> that. You know, but but there is some kind of meaning to that. Maybe he just really likes her eyebrows. Who knows? Dude's got his own um, little fetishes. He likes. He's an eyebrow fetish guy. Okay, but now we're gonna get a little bit of a shift in the analogy, at least temporarily. He's gonna try out another analogy. Uh, while thus to ballast, ballast is the stuff that you put in ships that makes it so that, that it, it floats and doesn't sink or, or you know go too heavy in one way. It's basically just empty stuff you put in there. It could be anything for the most part. I mean, I think there's a general material that they use, but you could put other things in there just to kind of keep the boat going uh, with the right weight and not flip over. While thus to ballast love, I thought, and so more steadily to have gone, with wares which would sink admiration, I saw I had love's finesse overfraught. Whew. Okay, so love now is ballast. Uh, the angel metaphor dissipates to air for a moment. I don't. We don't know where it goes, but you know, or where he's coming from. Why is he doing this? He just. It's a new stanza. He does what he wants. Right. Um, his gods. He calls them. Or his goods, I should say, he calls them wares, right? With wares which would sink admiration. Uh-oh, so we have a problem here. So that should be a, an, an indication of something. So we have, while thus to ballast love I thought and so more steadily to have gone. So his love is, you know, so strong with wares which would sink admiration. I saw I had love's penis overfraught. He had a, a pinnace, P-I-N-N-A-C-E, is a type of small boat ship, of, you know, especially during this era. Uh, it could have oars or it could have sails, but it's a small little boat. And he's overloaded it. So, th- not, you know, he's he changed the analogy from the angel medium, and he's now saying that maybe my love is too powerful. It's too much. I'm too manly with my, my strong masculine love. It's too much for the woman. Maybe that's the problem here. So I think that's what he's saying here is, well, thus to ballast love, I thought, and so more steadily to have gone, with wares which would sink admiration, I saw I had love's penis overfraught. Every, every thy hair for love to work upon is much too much, some fitter must be sought. So every one of your hairs my love has worked upon, but this is too much. We need someone to alter our love. A fitter is somebody who would alter garments and shoes to make them fit. So they, they're a fitter. They, pretty simple. They make things fit by altering, by cutting, cutting away usually. But you can also just take it as just altering. Whether it's cutting away is you know open to, for debate depending on what you're trying to do. Maybe you just need to pin it back or something. So every, every thy, every your hair for love to work upon is much too much. So I've worked upon every one of your hairs, right? I, that's how much I love you because I'm a man. Right? And men love more. Is <laughs> much too much. Some fitter must be sought. So this love that I've given body to, right? That my that's in, in given body through your body. He's he's argued already. Must we we need a fitter? We need someone to alter it. Here's the next couple stands or a couple lines. For nor in nothing nor in things extreme and scattering bright can love in here. Now in here means basically exist. 
essentially exist. So for nor in nothing, nor in things extreme, so this extremeness that is for the nothing that is the paradox we've talked about with love, and scattering bright can love exist. So it can't not exist, I think is kind of what he's saying. I believe. <laughs> That's my best take on that. Then, as an angel, face and wings of air not pure as it, yet pure doth wear. So remember what I taught doth wear, so thy love may be my love's fears. I'll talk about that in a second. Remember what I said about medium, air, and the angel. The angel is more pure than the air in this period. That's their belief. So he's saying that, so, so in other words, the medium, the thing that carries the angel into existence is less pure than the, the actual angel. Now, the angel in this analogy is the masculine love that he feels for her. And she is the medium, right? So which one's more pure? Well, his love for her. His love for her is more pure than her. Then as an angel face and wings of air, not pure as it, yet pure does wear, doth wear. So your love may be my love's sphere. So then, you know, he starts by saying, he finally in, in puts a little bit of her love. So your love may be my love's sphere. So if you love me, we can put that in this fear that I'm sphere that I'm building for us. So the love that he's creating is now this circular sphere that consumes both of them. Of course, it just drowned them, but you know, whatever. <laughs> it's not too much, but but that's you know that that's kind of like saying, "Ah, oh, I love you so much that it it hurts you." I don't understand. Like you don't love me because I love you so much. What's that's weird? He lo he loves her too much. Right? That's, oh, what a horrible person. What kind of person would not appreciate that? Mm. Just such disparity. So there's a disparity. As is twixt air and angel's purity. As is twixt means between. It's betwixt. So just such disparity. So the disparity between that is between air and angel's purity. Remember we talked about the medium and the thing right the the medium and the even more pure angel is twixt is between woman's love and men's will ever be so he's saying two he, there's two ways i think two major ways to to interpret that uh, last line and this is the more famous one and of course the more sexist one as is a lot of this poem but it's the idea that the that the woman's love or the woman is the um medium and the men's love is you know so she's the the cause like right she he looks at her and that's where love becomes because and you know he said earlier also he aligned this with her body okay so she inspired the love in him and that's greater than the love that he inspired if he did inspire any love in her in her and it's more than um, will ever be. Now, another way of reading this, I think, this whole poem in general, another way of reading this, I think, and the way that I would prefer to read it because it's nicer, is the idea that the love cannot manifest itself in a bodily form unless both parties love equally until the angel Angel's purity and the heir's purity is just as pure as the woman's love and the men's love. Now, I do think that he's, you know, kind of being playful and he, he does that a lot. But, I, you know, I think he does probably mean that man, masculine love is superior, above, greater than, better than female love. Now, but the question I have for you and, and what you can think about, and you, you think about the way he's setting this up. Right, so he 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 talks about this intense love at the beginning. He loves her bef like more more than her body. You know, before I knew thy face, and it's this shapeless thing, and um, there it's a um, I, I the comparison to a shapeless flame, and an angel, and it has to take limbs of flesh, and else can nothing do, and it, it's um, you know, the child, the love, and the parent. He uses all these analogies and then it, it manifests itself in her body and in her love. And then 
you know, but it's he loves her so much that he's gonna sink this ship. That that's that just you know, it's just like sinking a ship. He loves her so much. He's gonna ruin the whole thing. Right. And we've seen this in other poems by him where his love is so much that the woman can't appreciate it even. You know, at least in his view. Every thy hair for love to work upon is much too much. Some fitter must be sought. So we gotta we gotta hone this in. And maybe we could do this together, he starts to say to her. And you know, for love to exist, we need to make it like a bottle, you know, like this angel. There's gonna be a purity, but ah, uh, of course, no matter what, no matter how much we fit, there's going to be a disparity. Just like there's a disparity between air and and the angel that it manifests, there's a, um, you know, a disparity between your, you and your love and mine. My love is inspired by the mere thought of you, uh, thought of you. Your love is inspired by something lesser. Now, one thing I do want you to think about, though, I think that this can help you and maybe you could play around with this, is what, who does love whom more? What? You know, is does does um do men love women more than women love men? I mean, it's it's something to think about. Do women perhaps love men for how they can provide some sustenance and a child, and that a woman always loves her child more than she loves her male, her her man, and she um you know maybe that's one way to think about it. Maybe the intensity that she thinks she feels for him is not as intense as he feels for her at least at its most intense. Now, why does it dissipate? Maybe this is a temporary thing. That Put that aside for a moment. Just think about when the love is there. Who is loving whom more? So who do you think? Who loves whom more? Men or women? And that is Aaron Angels. And I'll see you next time. Um, we'll do another Sunday Morning Poetry and more uh, Wordsworth. We're almost toward the end of Lyrical Ballads, the 1798 version. Although we have two big poems coming up, I'm going to be saving for the end the uh, poem Tintern Abbey, Abbey by Wordsworth and the poem The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Coleridge. So stay tuned, subscribe, pass this around. It really helps. And uh, the more you pass this around, send it to an email, whatever. Uh, you know, if it helps you with anything, please let me know at kirkbarbera at troubadourmag.com. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.